Okay, so we'll start with the Heart Sutra. And this time when we recite the Heart Sutra, try and really listen for parts that you've been meaning to ask about. Yeah, parts that you've been stuck on this whole time or wanting to clarify. Um, and uh, also, you know, reconnect with the meaning and make sure that it's going in somehow. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagawan was dwelling on Mass of Vultures Mountain in Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage, who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch and no phenomena. There is no eye element and so on up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of great knowledge the mantra, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata om gate gate paragate parasamgate bodhisoha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated, even the Tathagatas rejoice. 
the Bhagawan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. And so then being with that, and then we'll just briefly review the title. So remembering the title is actually, we, we shorten it to the Heart Sutra, but the full title is The Essence of Far-Reaching Discriminating Awareness, The Vanquishing Lady Surpassing All or the Arya Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. And then the sutra often starts with, in the language of India, and says the title in Indian, in Sanskrit, and then in the language of Tibet, and says it in Tibet, Chomdan Dema in this case, and then in the language of English, blah, 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 in the language of Hebrew, blah, blah, blah. And it's actually kind of an acknowledgement of the unbroken oral tradition from the time of the Buddha until now, as well as an acknowledgement of the work of translators. So you're kind of tapping into the lineage of blessings by acknowledging the, the source language and the you know, kind of sequence of languages that got to you in this present day. So sometimes people ask, why do we say prayers in Tibetan? Why do we say mantras in Sanskrit? Why do we use languages that are not our own or languages that we don't know? And part of the reason is so many practitioners have developed realizations on the basis of these languages using these words. It's as if you can energetically ride the coattails of their previous work. Or like, uh, you know, like a flock of geese, you know, with the one at the head and then all of the others behind it can kind of go into the slipstream and go more quickly. Yeah, without so much resistance. It's like we're entering into the stream of people who have done this work before. So there's a connection with unbroken oral tradition, which is just nice and good and reassuring and helps us understand these teachings have existed in an unbroken way all the way from the time that they were given. But it also helps us tune in more energetically to the practitioners from the Buddha until now. So it's like, it wouldn't really even matter what the words were in a certain way, just that practitioners relied on them. You know, like a family tradition. You know, some words in your family have particular power because your ancestors have been saying them for a long time. Maybe it's actual prayers in Hebrew, or maybe it's just family expressions. And so it's like the, the words take on more power because of who it was that was repeating them. So we're trying to kind of synchronize by respecting and connecting with these previous languages. So that's part of the reason why we recite things in Sanskrit or in Tibetan. And um, in most of the sutras, there will be an acknowledgement of the languages leading up to your own. So Arya Bhagavati, we look at Bhagavati or Bhaga. This has the connotation of having overcome obscurations and realized all qualities. One meaning implies destructions and the other implying fortune in the sense of both endowed and destroyer. So conqueror of all obscurations. Then vati or van is like a suffix, which denotes possession, also means transcendent. This meaning of the word appears in the word nirvana. And so in the title, there's Bhagavati, but then in the sutra, you hear the Bhagawan, the Bhagawan, the Bhagawan, you hear the Buddha being described in this way. And he's described in this way because we're pointing to a specific quality. 
so then the meaning in Tibetan, so Bhagavati in Sanskrit, Chamdendema in Tibetan. Cham, conqueror, den, possesses something, de, gone beyond. So literally, the conqueror who possesses something great and has gone beyond, sometimes called the endowed transcendent destroyer. Then the ma is the feminine ending, the woman conqueror, the female conqueror. It also connotes mother because the perfection of wisdom is likened to the mother who gives birth to Aryas. So the perfection of wisdom is where Aryas come from. And we describe it in this feminine way for a lot of reasons, but you see Prajnaparamita, the Buddha of wisdom up here, depicted in the feminine sense. And there's also a sense of wisdom relating to openness, wholeness, expansion, all of those kind of classic feminine principles. So Prajna Paramita, yeah? Prajna is knowledge wisdom. And so we're talking about knowledge the other side, gone, heart or essence. So this is far reaching, discriminating awareness. Because in Indian physiology, this is the place where consciousnesses pervade, they all gather at the heart. Paramita is perfection of wisdom, can either mean which makes you perfect or that which takes you to the other side can mean the resultant perfection, the other side. So either the means or the result. So Prajna Paramita is often translated as the perfection of wisdom. Dr. Burzen says more specifically, it can be called far reaching discriminating awareness. So this is a sutra, and a sutra, a Buddhist sutra, is not necessarily all words spoken from the mouth of the Buddha himself. Within Buddhist sutras, there are words that were spoken by the Buddha himself, words that were blessed by the Buddha, and words that were permitted or allowed by the Buddha. And this is kind of tapping into what are called the five excellences, which make this sutra particularly important, significant, and reliable. So the first one is the excellent teacher. So thus I have heard the I can indicate the excellent teacher, Shakyamuni was present and he said, well said, well said. So those were words spoken from the Buddha's mouth. Thus I have heard also this type of prologue or narrative is classed as words that were permitted or allowed by the Buddha, number three. Something that was added or spoken after the actual teaching was delivered as a way of introducing the teaching that ensued. So this usually refers to the disciple Ananda, who was the Buddha's kind of heart attendant his secretary, the person that traveled with him everywhere. After the Buddha passed away, Ananda was present at the council to kind of write down the Buddha's teachings. And he had a photographic memory. He had such a clear mind. He was able to understand and remember everything that was said. So then the exchange between Shariputra and Avalokiteshvara are words blessed by the Buddha. So they were like inspired by the Buddha. So thus I have heard, we're still just the first sentence. Heard indicates the excellent assembly or excellent retinue that was present. This refers to the great community of monks and the great community of bodhisattvas that were present during the giving of this teaching. 
So it was all high level students. At one time indicates the excellent time. A Buddha communicates and is understood in any language. These types of qualities that are present during the speaking of the sutra are taught or indicated by the phrase at one time. The excellent place is indicated by the words in Rajagriya at Vulture's Peak. This was an auspicious place for such a discourse, the place of the king where King Bimbisara lived. And the fifth feature is the excellent teachings, here referring to emptiness. So at that time, the Bhagawan, now we understand Bhagawan, Bhagawati from the title, meaning foe destroyer, having cleared all obscurations, pacified all obstacles. The Buddha was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. So the profound refers to emptiness, the depth of which is difficult to fathom, and appearance refers to the sublime wisdom that knows this profundity. The categories or phenomena refer to things like the aggregates and the constituents. So these are the subjects which form the basis for realizing emptiness or that form the basis of the emptiness we're discussing. So all of these categories of phenomena, each individually are empty of inherent existence. So also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, also means Lord Buddha wasn't just meditating. He was also aware of everything around him simultaneously, was also inspiring the students to have this debate or this discussion back and forth because a fully enlightened Buddha is able to abide in ultimate truth with awareness of relative truth at the same time. So at that time means everyone was seated or everyone had like become still and was listening. Bodhisattva, you all know, means an uncontrived aim for Buddhahood, someone who has this. The Mahasattva is to emphasize placing all beings in enlightenment. He is also called a great being, which is the part to fulfill all other beings goals. Buddhahood for other beings sake. Arya, someone who has perceived emptiness directly, a higher being. Chenrezig Avalokiteshvara in this case is considered a 10th ground bodhisattva or was showing the aspect of being at that level. So he was like this close from enlightenment in this scenario or was showing the aspect of being at that stage. So Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit, Avlokita means one who looks down, not in the sense of arrogant, but in the sense of like holding deer. And it's hard to see in the picture because it's small, but all of this white are actually a thousand arms with a thousand hands. And in the palm of each hand is an eye able to see the suffering of all sentient beings without exception and hold them with perfect compassion. Ishvara means like capable one. So the name for Avalokiteshvara in, in uh, Tibetan is Chenrezig. So the practice of the profound mentioned here is the intellectual meditation on emptiness. This refers to the lineage of the profound view which comes from Manjushri through Atisha and the lineage of extensive activity which comes from Maitreya through Asanga. Usually they are contrasted, but here they are conjoined to show a union between acting like a bodhisattva and thinking like a bodhisattva. So this is where it gets very important. He beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent existence. So he's starting to look at the five parts of a person going on into meditation on the five heaps or collections. 
Each one is a collection or a huge pile of things, so-called skandhas. The first is the skanda of form, because we are so absorbed in forms of all types in our daily life. So the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shari Putra. Shari Putra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this. And here's the most important part. Correctly, understanding tenets, going to the subtlest and the most profound, and repeatedly, again and again, with that correct understanding, looking at the five aggregates and seeing that they are empty of inherent nature. So again and again, you do this. This is the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom and how to realize it. So we get into first just form, right? So form is empty, emptiness is form. His holiness says that form is emptiness means that the final nature of a form is its natural lack of inherent existence. Because they are dependent arisings, they are empty of an independent self-powered entity. That emptiness is form means that this natural lack of inherent existence makes possible the forms which are established from it in dependence upon conditions. Since forms are the basis of emptiness, emptiness is form. Forms appear as like reflections of emptiness. Thich Nhat Hanh says, form is the wave and emptiness is the water. You can understand through that image. The Indians speak in a language that can scare us, but we have to understand their way of expression in order to really understand them. In the West, when we draw a circle, we consider it a zero, nothingness. But in India, a circle means totality, wholeness. The meaning is the opposite. So form is emptiness, emptiness is form, is like wave is water, water is wave. Because one exists, everything exists. Sokni Rinpoche says, when Buddhists talk about emptiness as the basis of our being, we don't mean that who or what we are is nothing, a zero, a point of view that can give way to a kind of cynicism. The actual teachings on emptiness imply an infinitely open space that allows for anything to appear, change, disappear, and reappear. The basic meaning of emptiness is openness or potential. At the basic level of our being, we are empty of definable characteristics. So therefore in emptiness, there is no dot, dot, dot. And it goes into many categories of how all of these categories are like wave is water, water is the wave, form is empty, emptiness is form. So then you could say feeling is emptiness, emptiness is feeling. I is emptiness, emptiness is I. You could go through all of these categories of phenomena which are described once again, the five aggregates, the 12 sources, the 18 constituents, all interdependent, all of them empty in the same way that we talked about with form. And then no suffering, origination, cessation, and path means that the Four Noble Truths don't come about all by themselves. No single one of them stands alone, unrelated. The truth of suffering 
pain, change, all pervasive conditionality, truth of origin, karma and disturbing emotions, namely innate ignorance, self-grasping, true cessation, initially the liberated path of the path of seeing, true cessations are from the perceptual realization of emptiness onward, truth of path, positive karma accumulated through both method, the Eightfold Path, etc., and wisdom. So when we're looking at the Four Noble Truths, and it looks like three and four are switched on the slide, sorry about that. But when we're looking at the Four Noble Truths, you're re remembering suffering is only suffering because of causes and conditions, parts and context, and being merely labeled by the mind, the way it's labeled dependent on karma. The cessations are the same. So it's, it's important to see that what we call even the path itself, we're not hanging on to is something self-existent divorced from context. So then when we look at the mantra, gate, the path of accumulation, gate, the second one, path of preparation, Paragate, path of seeing. Parasamgate, path of meditation. Bodhi, path of no more learning, Buddhahood. These, this mantra is referencing the whole path to enlightenment as directions. First, second, fourth, fifth, you know, like this. Do this, then do that. Here's how but it's also here's why, and it's also none of them inherently exist in and of themselves. So it's like an inspiration from the Buddha and a direction from the Buddha and an explanation from the Buddha. At the end of the sutra, it goes on and on about the mantra is this, the mantra is that, and that's not by accident. The mantra of great knowledge is the opposite of ignorance that binds one to samsara. Through this knowledge of wisdom, one destroys the three poisons of ignorance, attachment, and anger. The unsurpassed mantra refers to the path of seeing. There is no greater method than the perfection of wisdom for saving one from the extremes of existence and peace, meaning samsara and nirvana equal to the unequaled refers to the path of meditation. The state of a Buddha is unequaled. There is no state higher. Continuing this practice, repeatedly meditating on emptiness, etc., to its conclusion, one achieves this enlightened state. Mantra that quells all suffering refers to the path of no more learning, where all manifest and latent suffering is completely destroyed. It is true means when ultimate truth is manifest, for example, in an Arya Bodhisattva's single pointed equipoise focused on emptiness, only truth appears, not false, Within the perceptual wisdom realizing emptiness, there is no grasping at the conventional or deceptive truth. So it's a, it's a really quick overview, but basically the Heart Sutra contains pretty much all of the main topics in Buddhism. Yeah, it contains all of the main lists or the main categories and is basically saying, know this and know that it does not stand alone. Come to understand the details, the way each list functions, the way each list comes about, because that will help your mind develop and transform. But don't get so stuck as to think that any of these are self-existent. So it's just that like touch and let go or clarify and expand. You're trying to marry up relative truth and ultimate truth 
as much as you can so that you can develop relative bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta as best as you can. A lot of questions, but uh, uh, one, one uh, little, little thing about uh, the word matriya and maitri. Mm -hmm. I, I heard uh, once uh, um, that uh, maitri is like emptiness or um, something. So is maitri and matriya the same? Uh, no, and neither of those words are in the Heart Sutra, um, you know, as obviously. We're when we are talking about the lineage that's combined in the Heart Sutra, one of the lineages is from Maitreya. Maitreya is the Buddha of loving kindness. Maitri means loving kindness. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's uh, connected. Yeah. Yeah, it's embodied. Yeah, certainly Maitri is something that is achieved through achieving the perfection of wisdom. Because the perfection of wisdom is a perfection, which means it has bodhicitta. And if it has bodhicitta, definitely there is love, Maitri, and compassion, Karuna and shunyata emptiness, but wisdom realizing emptiness. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, other other words that were jumping out at you as either interesting or confusing. Uh, when Tikhlatan is uh, talking about the Heart Sutra and referring to uh, there is no death. Uh, explains that uh, when you dead, then you become uh, ash, as ash, uh, uh, ashes. You uh, nourish the ground. You nourish the trees. You become you become the tree for, or an animal that eats from the tree. And, and it doesn't speak about uh, the bardo and and all uh, this meaning that we're talking about, that uh, subtle consciousness continues. And... He's just talking about the form aggregate, just the form aggregate. He's not talking about the self. So the form aggregate will become dirt and nourish the plants. And it's all very scientific and biological and interdependent circle of life, yay. You know, it's nice, <laughs> makes you feel connected. You are stardust, blah, 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 <laughs> right? But um, Thich Nhat Hanh speaks in very accessible terms, right? In kind of universal terms. But he also goes on to explain how form is empty. Emptiness is form is like wave and water, water and wave. So he'll go more deeply but in the Zen tradition, they're not necessarily as precise about philosophy. They more just kind of give you an idea and see what your mind does with it. So maybe the Zen tradition is for people with sharper faculties who need fewer words to understand the deeper meaning. But it can also be for people who need things to be simple. Yeah, so both. <laughs> Yeah, either for very simple, basic understanding, or for very deep understanding that you can access directly because you have a strong imprint from previous lives. So when he's talking about the earth and the soil, he's just talking about the form aggregate because it's relatable. Because we always, we already agree because we understand science a little bit. So the ashes are not the self, you know, the ashes are the form aggregate turning into ash. But then we will take another form aggregate or we will embody another form. Does that answer your question or did you have a different question than that? 
answers. Yeah. Yeah. I was asked something, uh, and I di I didn't have the answer, so I said I I asked someone who can uh, answer uh, about the number growing of people in the world. The question is if. Uh, if uh, consciousness is also uh, cycling and there is no, there are no uh, new consciousness says uh, joining. Mm -hmm. So uh, how come? Why more people? More people in the world. Yes. Uh, two reasons. <laughs> okay. First reason: Earth is not the only planet with life aliens right aliens you're with me all right so earth is not the only planet with life one reason right yay aliens right we're so wild um second reason think about how so many insects are dying you know we're losing bees and we're losing many insects many uh animals are becoming extinct and even just like the soil underneath the building has probably more insects and organisms than there are people in the whole world. So each of those insects has Buddha nature, has good karma from the past, and when they die, could become a human again. Yeah, so it's not like more sentient beings are being born, it's that sentient beings are having the karma to be reborn as human. Does that make sense? Uh, I, I thought it was the answer I thought, I said, I think it's maybe uh, a cycle, a human cycle of other form, uh, other types of sentient beings that are now cycling into human form, but mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if it's the right answer. Aliens, yeah. I, I, yeah, I didn't go there. You don't have to tell them about aliens. They will think you're weird. <laughs> Our yeah. <laughs> so if somebody scratches your car today in the parking lot, can you think form is empty, emptiness is form, and it will help you not be so mad? <laughs> if, uh, if you're feeling, I don't know, it's too hot or it's too cold and you're uncomfortable and close to becoming grumpy can you think feeling is emptiness emptiness is feeling and let go a little bit yeah it's a good day to try it because it's 40 degrees here today Oof, oh. <laughs> 40 degrees is empty empty emptiness is 40 degrees <laughs> Because remember, like if it had been 45 degrees yesterday, this would feel like a relief, <laughs> you know? And if you just come from winter in Montana, you would say, oh, this is nice, like a sauna. So nice. <laughs> right? So it's like, it's not that abstract, the Heart Sutra. It sounds like this weird poetry or this strange philosophy, it's actually very direct in your face. It's very much your life, yeah? So it's like, find these moments where you believe and have made something concrete and then use emptiness and dependent arising to loosen the grip, which relaxes the mind and relaxes the body. And then more creativity and openness is there. More possibilities you have. But um, remember His Holiness's book, Essence of the Heart Sutra. This book is really excellent. So if you ever want to read more about the it's Essence of the Heart Sutra, okay? Okay, so we dedicate yeah. all of the energy of the class. May it go this direction. May all beings everywhere plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, 
or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, check your email if you haven't checked already because it explains about our guest speaker today. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're cute, yeah. Okay, see you soon. Yeah.